வணக்கம் வாட் இன்வெஸ்டிகேஷன்ஸ் கேன் பி டூ ஃபார் அ சைல்டு அஃபெக்டட் பை அ பர்த் பிரேக்கியல் பிளெக்சஸ் பாலிசி வில் அன் எம்ஆர்ஐ ஆர் அ சிடி ஸ்கேன் ஹெல்ப் அண்ட் இன் தட் ரிகார்ட் விச் வுட் பி பெட்டர் அண்ட் எம்ஆர்ஐ ஆர் அ சிடி ஸ்கேன் ஆல் திஸ் அண்ட் மோர் இன் திஸ் வீடியோ basically the investigations that can be done for an infant or a child with birth brachial plexus palsy can be broadly divided into imaging studies and electrodiagnostic studies we shall be talking about the different imaging studies for birth brachial plexus palsy in this video imaging studies can be x-rays ultrasonography computed tomography magnetic resonance imaging and other modalities when we do these investigations we are looking for information on nerve issues that is the muscle component and the bony issues because as we have seen in the previous video in birth brachial plexus palsy it is not just involvement of the nerves there is a muscle imbalance and the bones and skeleton also gets modified the commonest x rays that can be taken which will help us are fractures of the chest and the limbs which may show fractures or subluxations of the cervical spine the humerus or clavicle in the newborn we have seen in the previous video that a fracture of the humerus may mimic a birth brachial plexus palsy and if there is a concomitant fracture of the clavicle in a birth brachial plexus palsy the prognosis changes and if there is a child with b2p2 along with forearm extensor deficits it could be a concomitant fracture of the humerus with coincidental radial nerve palsy also a routine chest x-ray will also reveal a diaphragmatic paralysis consequent to a phrenic nerve lesion this will be manifested by elevation of that involved side of the diaphragm as in this example where there is a right sided diaphragmatic palsy X-rays will also reveal a lot of issues about the shoulder complex. It may show scapular rotation that is the projection of the superior angle above the clavicle discussed as the putty sign in the previous video and this can be seen in the anteroposterior view because of the internal rotation contracture the greater tubercle epiphysis becomes projected over the humeral head in some older infants or children the humeral head subluxates dorsally and the coracoid process and acromion may be deformed in a caudal direction with increasing deformity the glenoid retroversion increases and the glenoid becomes convex or biconcave the humeral head may also appear small and irregular with the coracoid process appearing elongated on the involved side an x-ray will also help to exclude sprengel deformity and arthrogryposis multiplex congenita an x-ray of the elbow will help to exclude traumatic lesions to look for secondary deformities like mild hypoplasia of the capitulum or trochlea and also features of anterior radial head subluxation in older children ultrasonography too has a role to play and it has got the advantages that it is non invasive and user and patient friendly but with ultrasound it is difficult to differentiate nerve structures from other surrounding tissues the presence or absence of roots at the neural foramina is inconsistently recognized and the ultrasound yields less detail than an mri an empty foramen may be indicative of a root avulsion thickening of the nerve structures can be recognized the entrapment of radial nerve in associated humeral shaft fractures can be diagnosed with ultrasound alone the shoulder visualization in younger children can be done with ultrasound because it is predominantly a cartilaginous joint in that age dynamic ultrasound can be used to assess glenohumeral subluxation and the extent of a reduction if it has been done one line is drawn along the posterior margin of the scapula through the humeral head the second line is drawn from the posterior margin of the glenoid tangentially along the posterior margin of the humeral head these two lines make an angle 
and this is known as the alpha angle. The normal alpha angle is less than 30 degrees. This ultrasound of the shoulder of a 4 month old girl shows a normal alpha angle of 27 degrees. Whereas the shoulder ultrasound of this 3 month old girl with birth brachial plexus palsy shows an alpha angle of 41 degrees which is definitely not normal. Computerized tomography has its own advantages. It is reliable for discovering avulsion injuries. It allows separate evaluation of the ventral and dorsal nerve roots and detection of intradural nerve defects is possible with computerized tomography equal to standard myelography and MRI. But it has many disadvantages also. In babies, there will be a need for a GA. Intrathecal contrast application may be needed and this may have complications. Radiation exposure is more and there is uncertainty when determining the correct spinal level because of the increased distance from the spinal cord to the foramen. Normally, the anterior and posterior hypodense root shadows can be traced from the spinal cord within the contrast filled subarachnoid space to the exit foramina. In this example, the roots can be traced on the right side. On the left side, we cannot see the roots but we can only see a pooling of the contrast known as the pseudo meningocele. This indicates avulsion of the roots on this side. Just an absence of the hypodense root shadows is also suggestive of root avulsion even if there is no pseudo meningocele. A pseudo meningocele contains cerebrospinal fluid that communicates with the CSF surrounding the brain or spinal cord and it is not lined by dura. In brachial plexus injury, the key feature is that the nerve root avulsion pseudo meningocele does not contain any neural elements. However, the presence of a pseudo meningocele is not absolute proof of root avulsion and a pseudo meningocele may mask both the root shadows of the intact rootlets and even avulsed rootlets. As pseudo meningocele may extend to more than one spinal level, the diagnostic problem also extends to those levels involved. The CT myelography cannot demonstrate ruptures or other types of lesions of spinal nerves that occur within the foramen or in their extra foraminal course. The CT helps in detection of bony problems after the ossification of the shoulder increases around early puberty. Here, it helps in assessing the bony congruency of the glenohumeral joint or the absence of this congruency. So, CT is technically not ideal for imaging the cartilaginous shoulder joint in infants. It is magnetic resonance imaging or MRI that plays a very big role in imaging of children and infants with birth brachial plexus palsy. Usually, high strength that is 1.5 to 3 Tesla MRI units are used to provide high resolution images that enable visualization of different types of nerve lesions. There are many advantages of the MRI used as imaging in birth brachial plexus palsy infants and children. It avoids radiation, it is non-invasive, it can be performed under mild sedation in babies, it is less time consuming than CT myelography studies, it does not require anesthesia personnel and it is cost effective. Let us see where the MRI comes in useful. Visualization of the spinal cord and the visualization of the roots that arise from the spinal cord can be done with an MRI. But when the spinal nerve enters the foramen, it is not possible to visualize it with an MRI. But in the extra foraminal portion where the plexus forms and the branches are formed, the MRI again comes in useful. Visualization of the spinal cord with the MRI can use T2 sagittal images, T2 axial images and T1 sagittal images. The T2 sagittal images are the most commonly used to evaluate spinal cord at a glance and here the CSF appears white, edema appears bright in color and contusion appears dark. T2 axial images are used to correlate findings and confirm the level of the avulsion if it has occurred. T1 sagittal images 
are used to detect contusion and here the CSF appears dark in color. If the root shadows of the spinal nerves can be traced from the spinal cord to the respective exit foramina, there is no avulsion. If there is an interruption of a root shadow on an axial image, the coronal image should be checked for confirmation because continuity is easily missed in the axial 2 mm slices. When images in both planes do not show continuous roots, it confirms avulsion. MRI can detect total avulsion of both roots, avulsion of the dorsal root only or avulsion of the ventral root only or even avulsion of few of the rootlets. For example, this MRI coronal image shows avulsion of the C6 root on the right side and intact roots on the left side. Another example showing axial MRI images with normal C5 roots on the right side with avulsion of the C6 roots on the same side. So on axial and coronal views, the roots can be traced to the dural exit but not along their intravertebral foraminal course. For checking the intactness of the nerve at this level, we have to rely on intraoperative monitoring techniques like the evoked potentials which have their own restrictions and limitations. But once the nerve exits the foramen, they can be imaged using high strength at least 1.5 Tesla MRI scans, different T1 and T2 weighted imaging in axial, coronal and sagittal planes with additional use of reformatting techniques. But precise imaging of the extra foraminal brachial plexus requires scanning times of more than an hour sometimes. It may be a little difficult in children for maintaining the required protocols with only mild sedation and may require anesthesia. In short T1 inversion recovery STIR MRI, the plexus is slightly hyper intense to muscle, so it can be easily visualized. Loss of continuity of the nerves can be seen. In a neuroma, the normal fascicular anatomy is lost and will be replaced by a thickened mass of disorganized proliferating axons and fibrous tissue that can be recognized on MRI as a fusiform mass. Post-traumatic perineural fibrosis of the brachial plexus may be focal or diffuse. It may be recognized as a thickening of the plexus elements with ragged borders. So all the four types of injury that can occur to the nerves in birth brachial plexus palsy, nerve avulsion, nerve ruptures, neuromas and neuropraxias, MRI can help in diagnosing all of them. Let us see how. Let us see what are the features that can be seen in an MRI in a case of nerve avulsion, nerve rupture, neuroma and neuropraxia. In a nerve avulsion, there would be a non-visualization of the nerve roots in the spinal canal or a discontinuity seen in the nerve roots, a pseudo meningocele, focal surface defect at the nerve root exit zone on the spinal cord, dural defect with CSF leakage and sometimes denervation edema in the paraspinal muscles. In a case of nerve rupture, there would be a defect in the nerve as it is being traced along its course. A neuroma will be made out as a fusiform mass. This can indicate complete or incomplete ruptures. It could be a perineural fibrosis also. In case of neuropraxia, there may be a thickening of the nerve and sometimes increased signal intensity compared to the opposite side. MRI is the superior imaging modality for imaging the shoulder joint in children. The congruency between the humeral head and the glenoid or any deformity of the glenoid can be visualized. The MRI can also be used to assess muscle mass in B2P2 in which reduced muscle mass has been described around the shoulder. In this example, MR image of unaffected shoulder shows normal articulation of a largely cartilaginous humeral head with a normal glenoid. In this image, the humeral head articulates with the posterior articular surface of an abnormally shaped biconcave glenoid. In 1989, Kawai et al. compared the modalities of imaging that is myelography, CT myelography and MRI and found that in myelography 84% true positive images were obtained. In CT myelography 94% true positive images 
and in MRI, the same 94% true positive images were obtained. As far as imaging modalities are concerned, there are other modalities which are less used and which are upcoming also sometimes. Arthrography is used for visualization of the cartilaginous elements of the infant shoulder, but it is an invasive procedure and influenced by projection artifacts. It is used to assess the deformity and to assess the reduction after humeral head subluxation. MR myelography is an imaging technique which is highly sensitive in detecting lesions of the peripheral nerves in adults. It is not suited to study the smaller nerves like in birth brachial plexus palsy. The high spin equa MRI and the diffusion weighted MRI are other modalities of imaging. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Please do click on the shown links to see more on the introduction to birth brachial plexus palsy and the video about the etiology of birth brachial plexus palsy. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, trauma surgery, plastic surgery and ethics. Manakkam.